is the neighborhood connection. Uh -huh. Which one? Let's go. Join the phone up and head to the This is Neighborhood Connect. We're here live at the National Civil Rights Museum. I am one of your co-hosts, Paul Young, Director of Housing and Community Development. And with me, I have the illustrious Joyce Cox. Oh, I love the way you say that. <laughs> well, uh, glad to be here yes. with you today, Joyce. And we have a special guest, uh, Dr. Lisa Househalter from the Shelby County Health Department is here with us today to talk about some of the things going on in the health department and some uh, work that we have in common around yes. green and healthy homes. Uh, so excited to have this conversation with you today. Before we dive into uh, the conversation about what all is happening, I think it'd be great if you could just introduce yourself to sure. the listeners. I know that a lot of people have met you, but some haven't. So it'd be good to hear a little bit about your background before you came into this role. Thank you. And first, I want to say I'm really excited to be here and appreciate the opportunity to be here with you and talk about public health and healthy homes. A little bit about my background. I'm a nurse by training. I started out as a district nurse or field nurse, which means that I visited people in their homes. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the reasons healthy homes are really important to me. For about 15 years in Nashville, did everything within that neighborhood. Um, from seeing new babies to seeing older people, and then spent um, a significant number of other years what we call back in the building, which means um, leading programs, um, anything from um, violence prevention work as well as all of our community-based health improvement work in Nashville and retired from there as what we call bureau chief, so had responsibility for a lot of different areas, including HIV and TB, mm -hmm. as well as health promotion. And I ended my career um, really leading a stimulus award, which I'm always very excited to talk about. That was pre-Affordable um, Care Act, mm -hmm. and that allowed us to really focus on um, healthy communities. That's great. Right. Yeah, well, Paul, we, we we finally stole somebody from Nashville. Right. We love How it when about it happens that, that way. Yes, we yes. Love it and I, I love way. Memphis, and I Yay. love being here. Well, Memphis is a great city, and we're excited to have you as part of our uh, city and, and leading important efforts on behalf of this city and county, might I add. So, so why don't you tell us a little bit about some of the, the things that are priority areas for the health department uh, today? I'm going to start with our new building because anybody who has been to the health department knows that our building is older, mm -hmm. outdated, and not necessarily customer friendly, mm -hmm. and we have serious parking problems. We're going to uh, break ground this summer for a new building, oh, okay. and the design of the building is very customer friendly. We will have parking spaces um, for our customers, so uh, it really changes our focus to be focused on the customer and assuring that we have a welcoming environment to anyone who comes in our health department. Mm -hmm. And then over the last couple years, we've been trying to focus very heavily on um, better service, and we'll continue to do that as well. If we talk about some of the major health issues that we're facing in our community, I think many of you are aware of what those are. But uh, the one I'll speak to first is the opioid crisis, because that's getting a lot of press currently. While we have less deaths and overdoses in Shelby County than the rest of the state, we still have a significant and rising problem. And it's important that we address that problem now and not wait exactly. for it to get as severe as some others. We have seen uh, reductions in those numbers of individuals who go on to have AIDS, but we still have HIV transmission, particularly amongst young people. So that's an issue that we still need to address um, in our community, particularly. And we have significant issues related to being overweight or obese. Mm -hmm. Critical issue, I will say, is poverty right. yes. and how poverty impacts um, living conditions, community conditions, and health outcomes. And I think that's, that's part of... Uh Obviously, that's the significant challenge that we deal with as a community. And when we talk about green and healthy homes, I think that that is really at the core of, of, of part of what we want to address. We want to figure out how can we make it uh, a more seamless system of support. Uh, we have so many different programs that range from programs that you manage through the health department. You have programs that we have in HCD and Shelby County Housing and through MLGW and TVA 
Uh, the hospitals have a impetus to uh, support uh, outcomes, better outcomes for their clients uh, that come to see them. And so with Green and Healthy Homes, that's an effort for us to all streamline the resources that we uh, have available so that we can have a more significant impact on those families. So uh, I know that you and I have gotten a chance to travel a little bit and talk about this uh, nationally uh, and it's been a, a pleasure getting to tap into your, your mind on these these important issues. Well, it sounds like it's a holi- holistic approach to just uh, health. Definitely. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, when, when we think of health and public health, it's not any different than anyone else. Exactly. It's body, mind, and spirit. Mm-hmm. It's um, also emotional well-being, and all of that is linked back to someone's home. Yeah. Um, but also linked back, I'll mention poverty again, it's really linked back to whether or not people have equal opportunity to be successful mm-hmm. and achieve positive health. And that begins within one's home and one's community. So I'm glad to work with Paul and others who are leading efforts to really impact change in our community for the positive to assure that everyone, um, particularly children, have an opportunity to achieve. This is Neighborhood Connect Podcast, and we are live at the National Civil Rights Museum. It's a taste of Memphis time. Neighborhoods commemorating MLK 50. Friday, April 6th from 5 to 10 p.m. at Tiger Lane. We will have entertainment, food trucks, children activities, surf rodeo, and neighborhood booths displaying their greatness. A taste of Memphis time. Friday, April 6th from 5 to 10 p.m. at Tiger Lane. For more info, go to memphishcd.org or call 901-636-6986. And it's going to be the bomb diggity. DC of that funky politics fame. We got a brand new show. It's called The Best in Blue. We'll cover your Memphis Police Department and how they work to keep us safe day and night. Best in Blue on the Kazookian Network. Neighborhood Connect. This is the Neighborhood Connect podcast show at the National Civil Rights Museum. And we have Dr. Householder with us and uh, we were just talking about the opioid uh, um, epidemic epidemic mm-hmm. exactly so tell me a little bit more about it. I, I I'm a mother of a 23 year old mm-hmm. so when Facebook uh, started he asked me mom why are you on Facebook and I said because I here is the end thing to do and I want to keep up with you so tell us a little bit more about the uh, epidemic I generally start by reminding people we have had a challenge with opiates, heroin in this country since after the Civil War. Um, And we all need to recognize that people have used heroin and other substances to for different reasons and become addicted to those over time. So people often say, well, what's the issue now? Because we've always had a problem. What's happened over the last decade or a little bit more than a decade really has to do with prescription drugs that are synthetic opioids. So opiates are those things that are um, naturally occurring that come from the poppy plant, which would be things like heroin Mm -hmm. um, that we're familiar with. But pharmaceutical companies, in an effort to really assure that people who had serious pain, like pain from cancer, Mm -hmm. were able to get adequate treatment, developed a whole line of synthetic opioids that were used primarily for um, individuals who had extreme pain or in the hospital setting. Mm -hmm. Those have now spread out to the street market. They um, are highly addictive. Um, More research has been done, and we recognize that individuals can become addicted to those in sometimes as little as three to four days. And as a result of that and prescribing patterns and really a national push to providers to um, assure that patients are pain-free, we went into this pattern U.S.-wide across Mm -hmm. our country of over-prescribing these drugs. Then, sort of like, oh, they're highly addictive, so we've got to take them off the market. Business-minded people 
um, yeah. do business things. Right. So then these drugs began to um, be made synthetically mm-hmm. in other countries and brought to our country. And people who could not access the pills any longer went to heroin because heroin is less expensive. We now have fentanyl, which is highly deadly, um, available on the market. Um, much of that is made el- elsewhere and brought into the United States. It's sold very um, inexpensively. And oftentimes it's laced into other drugs so that when we look at deaths in Shelby County, oftentimes people have multiple drugs on board and fentanyl has been a big component of that. So it's a growing problem. It's now moved from prescriptions to the legal market. And um, it's a combination really of a public health issue and a law enforcement issue. So so I have a question on that. I I mean, I've heard that this this issue is is not as much of a, an issue in the black community as it is in the white community. And, I, and you're an expert, so uh, what I've heard is just hearsay on Facebook and social media. Yeah. What are, what are the, the differences along racial lines, particularly as it relates to Memphis and the rest of the state? So I'll speak specifically to Shelby County more broadly, and I want to start out with saying there's really no community in Shelby County that's not affected. Wow. Every community, all races, all ethnicities are impacted in some way. When you look at the raw numbers, we have more white people who are impacted or um, ultimately have an overdose or a death related. But when we look at the trend line, so what it, what that is is how quickly it's rising in a given community. The trend line is actually much higher in um, the African-American community. What that says to us is now it's trending upward and that we're going to anticipate more deaths. And um, the one thing we keep saying in the health department, but also um, in other areas, is we have less deaths than East Tennessee and Middle Tennessee. We don't want to become um, like Middle Tennessee or East Tennessee. We want, really want to intervene early, and that's in all communities, including communities of color. Right. So what are some of the strategies, or are there any, to combat this problem? It's a great question. The strategies have to be, the strategies have to be um, comprehensive and integrated. There has to be a public health approach, which is more about prevention. What we know is that oftentimes people who become addicted to substances have experimented in their teen years, and they had access in their own home or in a family member's home. So we really encourage people: um, one, don't get a prescription if you don't need it. Take it as prescribed, but then get rid of it, dispose of it when it's no longer needed. Um, What we've been saying is count it, lock it, and drop it. So count your medicines, know what you have available, keep them locked up and away from others. It's not just um, youth who may come in your house, but it may be who someone comes in to do a house repair. Mm -hmm. Um, People will go through medicine cabinets to be able to access drugs and then to drop those in a... um, A pre-identified location where you can dispose of those. We actually have those on our website, so you can always go to Shelby TN Health, and you can look up where those drop sites are. Within the treatment community, there are a lot of focuses on uh, physicians and other health care providers to stop over-prescribing. Okay. But also we have to help people understand there's other ways to manage pain, and we have to challenge the health insurance industry or payers to pay for alternate ways to manage pain, things like physical therapy, occupational therapy, and so on and so forth. But then we also have to have a law enforcement approach to get the drugs off the streets. We can partner to do that. We're actually today looking at something called overdose mapping at the health department where we will know real time where an overdose occurs. That allows us to get a team to help people get into treatment, Mm -hmm. but also um, allows law enforcement to know where drugs are being sold so that they can stop the supply very quickly. And that's been successful in places like Baltimore or Pittsburgh where they have had a historic opioid um, problem Mm -hmm. and that this has reduced deaths over time in those communities. I like that. Count it, lock it, and drop it. Yes. This is the Neighborhood Connect podcast. We're here live at the National Civil Rights Museum with Dr. House Halter. 
So we wanted to have you here to talk about green and healthy homes. And so I'm going to transition back to that. But this is so interesting on this opioid uh, issue. And I I'm think happy you, to come back. <laughs> please do. Uh, and also remember on Kudzuki and there's the Funky Politics show that oh, uh, I'm sure that okay. uh, Larry and his team would be glad to have you on. Which so. I've loved to be on that show. I always love to be on that show. <laughs> yeah, I, they, they get pretty deep on that show. So you should be nervous about that one. Uh, but I want to transition back to green and healthy homes uh, and uh, – Talk to you about a little bit about uh, what what draws you and the health department into this conversation. What 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 makes you believe that this is something that's important for our community to focus on, and, and what is it? Well, Green and Healthy Homes Initiative is pretty much what it says. It's really promoting that everyone have an opportunity to a healthy home environment. In public health, we know that health starts at home. We treat people once they're ill. We try to promote healthy living, but we know the truth of it is where someone lives is what has a significant impact on their health um, health behaviors and their health outcomes long term. If you look at public health historically, public health is really a social justice yeah. entity. So we have a responsibility to elevate those things or conditions that impact health and housing, poor housing stock. The impact of housing on uh, one's income or uh, relative income is a significant social justice issue. And so it's important that we partner with people like you to elevate the issue and make a difference um, in our community. So some of those um, conditions would be what, like lead and uh, how we do our weatherization program at ATD. Uh, do those have an impact? in this uh, particular initiative? So that's one. I actually look at it very broadly from birth to death or crib to cradle, as they say. Mm -hmm. Uh, There are significant things that impact health. So lead is one. Mm -hmm. Uh, We know that has a particular impact on children and their ability to learn and the impact on their behavior over time. Um, Housing that has um, older paint. 1978 oh, yeah. and before, obviously there's a problem. Um, lead can also be in water and pipes, and those are things that are going to impact our children's ability to learn and be successful as adults. There can also be things um, like overcrowding, whether or not there's a crib in the home. Um, so we still have a high infant mortality rate in our community, and we promote children sleeping alone in in the bed, so the ABCs of safe sleep. So we want to make sure that in that home itself, there's also things that are not causing injury. For seniors, there's issues around trip and fall hazards, which impact. And then clearly, because we're in a place where we have a lot of moisture and heat, we have a lot of mold. Mm-hmm. And those are things that impact um, asthma, COPD, and other illnesses. And then I always have to talk about vectors because I'm in public health. So things like rodents, cockroaches, other things can impact health outcomes as well. So you mentioned the ABCs of yes. health. What is, what is ABCs? ABCs of uh, sleep. Of sleep. So, okay. yes, okay. a baby should sleep alone in a bed mm-hmm. in their crib. So. Okay. Alone in the bed in the crib. Yes. Okay. Alone in yeah. the bed crib. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. So how do, I mean, how do you, or do you, how can the community help your neighbors? How can they help to uh, be a part of this or have an impact on uh, Green and Healthy Homes initiatives? I would say several things. One, within your own home, people need to be aware. And and what are the resources available to them? What um, was mentioned earlier was we need to integrate these services. We have Mm -hmm. a lot of different services available, but community doesn't necessarily know where those services are or how to access. So that's what we're working on to make things more accessible, more seamless. Mm -hmm. So one should know that for themselves, but also for their um, neighbors. Right. The other is, um, you know, volunteering to help. Um, All of us have the ability to volunteer, and so I would say things like Habitat for Humanity Mm -hmm. that does significant work in communities. How do we volunteer with an agency like that that may be able to support and help someone in one's community? So I think we should uh, also note that um, there are a number of partners that have come together to to align to make this effort a reality for the city of Memphis. and. Mm -hmm. Uh, Green and Healthy Homes Initiative is actually an organization that's based out of Baltimore. Mm-hmm. It's going to be uh, working with us to help lead it. Labonner has played a significant role in uh, helping to 
gather to rally the troops, uh, so to speak. They've been uh, playing a, a big leadership role in, in pulling a lot of this together. And um, there are countless other agencies. I don't want to start saying <laughs> names, but um, you know, the city, county, uh, nonprofits, TVA, MLGW, Habitat for Humanity, a number of other agencies are all committed to um, a, making sure that our residents have an opportunity to live in uh, healthier housing uh, that's more energy efficient, which also speaks to some of the issues around poverty and how we can save save money. Mm. So we're coming towards the end of this episode, and I yeah. wanted to see if there was anything else that you had to add. Uh, we we could talk to you for hours, and I think yes. we're treasured to have you in this yes. in this city and county. Well, I appreciate being here and appreciate the opportunity to partner. Um, given where we're located and yeah. given that MLK 50 is right around the corner, there's a quote um, from Martin Luther King Jr. that I like to use as a public health person. So I want to end with that, if you don't mind. And I'm going to read it to make sure I don't um, um, mess it up. Of all forms of inequality, injustice in health care is the most inhumane. And I would say not just health care, but um, health in general. And that we really have to think of our responsibility to each other to create a humane community and assure that everyone has an equal opportunity to be healthy and achieve their fullest potential. Well, we thank you for being a part of the Neighborhood Connect podcast show uh, with Director Young and myself. And it has been a pleasure listening to you and talking to you. And we really want to find out more information uh, about the Green and Healthy Homes Initiative. Is there a website that our listeners could go to to just get some just some information? To keep it simple, they can Google Green and Healthy Homes Initiative. It'll take them to the Baltimore uh, site, and that will give all kinds of information on healthy homes. I'm Paul Young here with Joyce Cox and Dr. Householder. We'd like to thank you all for listening to Neighborhood Connect podcast powered by the Kudzukian Network here live at the National Civil Rights Museum. Thanks. Neighborhood Connect. Executive producer Larry Robinson for Kazukian. Neighborhood Connect is hosted by Paul Young and Joyce Cox. Recorded at the National Civil Rights Museum. Directed, produced, recorded, and distributed by Kazukian. It's a taste of Memphis time. Neighborhoods commemorating MLK 50. Friday, April 6th from 5 to 10 p.m. at Tiger Lane. We will have entertainment, food trucks, children activities, Cirque Rodeo, and neighborhood booths displaying their greatness. A taste of Memphis time. Friday, April 6th from 5 to 10 p.m. at Tiger Lane. For more info, go to memphishcd.org or call 901-636-6986. And it's gonna be the bomb diggity riffing on jazz when two friends get together to kick it about jazz it's called riffing on jazz catch us riffing on jazz every week right here on your favorite broadcast or podcast platforms riffing on jazz on the kazookian network Kazuki.